Today we're talking about thanksgiving, and tonight's sermon is entitled Fundamental Thankfulness. Fundamental Thankfulness, or Foundational Thankfulness. <laughs> they both work just fine. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 14. We'll begin in verse 27. I am so glad that this nation sets aside time to say thank you, Jesus. I know not everybody of the 350 million people in this country recognize the favor that God has bestowed upon this land, but I thank God that it is part of the culture of this nation that we have legislated it. We have set it aside. We have sanctified time. Whether everybody gets it or not, I'm so glad that it is part of our cultural heritage that the nation stops and says, Thank you, Lord, for the favor of God upon the United States of America. You know, going all the way back to 1621 with the pilgrims and the first uh, Thanksgiving ceremony, the first Thanksgiving uh, banquet that they had with the Native Americans that were here. I just say that that tradition has carried on, and I pray that it keeps carrying on, and I pray that it picks up speed, and I pray that it catches like fire, and I think it is the responsibility of the church to fan the flames of Thanksgiving in this nation. That it's not just about the turkey. It's not just about the cranberry. Well, mostly about the cranberry, but not just about the turkey. No, it is about a thankful people. It is about a nation that says, Thank you, God, for protecting us. Thank you, God, for favoring us. Thank you, God, for prospering us. I say thank you, God, for the freedoms that we have to gather, to worship, to speak, to honor you. I mean, this is truly the shiny city set upon the hill. The freedoms that we have in this land to gather together openly, freely, to worship. I say thank you, God. Everybody say thank you, God. And... I do believe that in the body of Christ, we, we really get it in the body of Christ because as, this, as the nation pauses each year at this time to say, thank you, God, it, it, is the, it is the culture of the church. It is the culture of the Christian every single day to be thankful unto the Lord for what God has done for each and every one of us. We get it. We are thankful for the grace. We are thankful thankful for the mercy. We are thankful for the favor. We are thankful for the blood. We are thankful for the word. We are thankful for the Holy Ghost. We are thankful for the church. We are thankful for the anointing. We are, I mean, from the Alpha to the Omega, we are thankful for everything that God has done for us. And and when we get up in the morning and step out of our bed and put on our slippers, we just need to pause and say, Good morning, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for everything that you have done for me. Hallelujah. For everything that you have done for me. I thank God for the cross. I thank God for the blood. I thank God for the imparting of His Spirit. I thank God that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I thank, you. I thank the Lord that I was not judged for my sins. I thank God that my name is, uh, or my life is engrafted into the family of God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I want to talk about fundamental thankfulness. Let's begin in Exodus chapter 14, verse 27. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, over the Red Sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Verse 28, Then the waters returned and covered the chariot, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so the people feared or reverenced the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant 
Moses. There was a great miracle that God performed among the Hebrews when they were in bondage in Egypt. The Bible says that God heard the cries of his people and he raised up a deliverer. That deliverer was Moses and he anointed Moses to speak to the Pharaoh of Egypt. And we understand the story well. There was 10 plagues, the last plague being the killing of the firstborn. And because of the Passover lamb, the blood on the doorpost and on the lentils, the death angel angel could not enter into the homes of the Hebrew people and so there was deliverance of the Hebrews because of the Passover lamb because of the blood of the lamb and so they came out of uh, uh, out of Egypt and uh, Pharaoh said uh, uh, double crossing them said I will not let them go and his army pursued after them and they were between the army of Pharaoh and they were between the Red Sea so they've been delivered by the blood of the lamb and now they're at the Red Sea they've got nowhere to go their back is against the sea as it were and God told Moses lift up your staff and in the lifting up this of the staff the sea parted they went through on dry ground and that is a type and shadow of coming through the blood so they were delivered by the blood of the lamb but then they were also delivered as they went through the Red Sea or went through the blood and once they got through the blood out of bondage out of Egypt and on their way to the promised land the enemy was pursuing after them and the blood closed up over the enemy the Red Sea closed up over the enemy and wash them away and that is a type and shadow of the Christian's experience in Christ we are delivered out of the penalty of sin we are delivered out of the bondage of sin and the blood of Jesus Christ washes away those Egyptians the blood of Jesus Christ washes away that sin and we are on the way to the promised land can somebody say amen it is a beautiful type and shadow of what God does in the life of the believer. Now, in chapter 15 of Exodus, the very next chapter, this is what Moses does. Verse 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke saying I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and the riders thrown into the sea the Lord is my strength and song he has become my salvation he is my God I will praise him praise is the fruit of our lips giving thanks unto his name I will thank him my father's God I will exalt him so Moses came through, he brought the nation through deliverance of Egypt. He brought them out of bondage. They went through the Red Sea, through miracle, sign, and wonder. They came out of Egypt, and the first thing Moses did was to say thank you. He was to memorialize it with a song of thanksgiving. Come on, somebody say amen. Now, this is a type and shadow of our experience in Christ. We have come through the blood. We've come through the Red Sea. We've come out of Egypt. We've come out of bondage. And the question is, is there a song in our heart? The question is, have we memorialized our deliverance from the bondage of sin? Have we memorialized personally in our heart? Have we memorialized what God has done for us so that we got, get up every single morning singing this song, the Lord has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the riders thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song. He has become my my salvation he is my God and I will praise him <laughs> well, what, what's your point pastor my point is this get a song in your heart my point is this let's be a thankful people my point is we have got so much to thank God for because we're not living in Egypt anymore the danger is is when we hang our thanksgiving on the expectation of the next thing God is going to do for us. 
We thank Him, oh, thank you, Lord, for my salvation. But then the next day, we've got to live our life, and we're believing God to do something, and Thanksgiving isn't going to come until God comes through for us. But I say he brought you out of Egypt, you got something to thank him for. I say he delivered you from Pharaoh, you got something to sing about. I say he brought you out by, by miracle, sign, and wonder. I said the enemy's been washed away by the blood. You should have a song in your heart. Hallelujah. Now, the danger is that you experience a tremendous moment of triumph. The danger is that we have been brought out by miracles, signs, and wonders. And then we forget what God has done in our life because we get caught up in the here and now. We get caught up in the moment. The very next chapter. Now, in chapter 14, God brought them through the Red Sea. In chapter 15, they're singing, they're celebrating. They're so happy that Moses has written a song for the nation to sing. But in chapter 16, it's a whole new story. Exodus 16, verse 2. There too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. <laughs> Welcome to the ministry. <laughs> he got them out of Egypt. He got the Egyptians off their back. They're out of bondage. And now they're complaining about them. Verse 3. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. They've forgotten about the bondage. They've forgotten about the toil and the work and the whips of the, of the taskmasters. We sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. I say, man, I brought you out of Egypt. God separated an ocean for you to get out of Egypt. You walked through on dry ground and saw a wall of water on this side and a wall of water on that side. And you saw the chariots and the horsemen and the armies of the enemy that wanted to kill you and enslave you. You saw God wash them away so that you could be free and now you're complaining because you don't have what you think you need the opposite of thankfulness is grumbling <laughs> grumbling begins when we walk by sight and not by faith grumbling is when our stomach starts to grumble I need food <laughs> I need, I need my needs met. I need, I need what I think I need. And that, that grumbling starts to talk louder than the song of victory you were just singing one chapter ago. They grumbled because they didn't have enough water. They grumbled because they didn't like the wilderness. They grumbled because they thought Moses was a bad leader. They grumbled because they missed Egypt. They grumbled because they weren't in the promised land yet. They grumbled because they thought God had let them down. Amen. Any grumblers in the house? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Say, not me. not me. Do you remember when they... We're at the bitter waters of Merah, and uh, Moses turned the bitter waters into the sweet waters when he cast the limb into there in Exodus 15 and verse 24. And so the people grumbled at Moses, saying, what shall we drink? And by miracle and sign, God turned the bitter water into sweet water or fresh water so that they could drink. And then they grumbled again in Exodus chapter 16, verse 2. When they didn't have food and God was going to feed them with manna and with quail in 16 and 2. It says the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And then again they grumbled when they wanted water. God was going to bring water out of a rock. They wanted water in Exodus 17 and 3. It says, but the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Nope. 
They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They grumbled against Moses. When you grumble, you are grumbling against something. When you're thankful, your thankfulness supports something. It says they grumbled against him. The very one that brought them out, they grumbled against him because their mindset was, where's the next blessing? But what I'm talking about today is the fundamental thankfulness of the believer. Because the blessing that overshadows all blessings is the cross of Jesus Christ. And if God doesn't do anything else for us, and I'm a faith preacher, you know that I preach that God is a good God who seeks to do good to you every single day. But if you haven't seen what you think God should be doing for you yet, all you need to do is think back to the day where you were in bondage in Egypt and it was by the blood of the Lamb that you were delivered out of that captivity and now you are a born again spirit spirit filled blood bought believer hallelujah hallelujah so i went through all of that <laughs> as a type and a shadow for the believer for the new testament believer because that all points to the cross moses delivering out the people out of egypt because of the blood of the passover lamb through the Red Sea. All of that points to the cross. That Jesus, our type of Moses, has delivered us out of the bondage of sin. Through, through, uh, through, through the punishment he received for, for us. Delivered us through the blood of the cross. And now we are free. The remembrance of that is communion. Because that talks about the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, this is Jesus talking about communion. He says, and when Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget. He says, don't forget this. I'm going to do something I do not want you to forget. I'm going to put my body on the cross and I'm going to stand in the sinner's stead. I'm going to suffer judgment so you don't have to suffer judgment and don't ever forget it. Let's keep reading. In the same manner, verse 25, also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. Do this in remembrance. Do this in remembrance. Do this in remembrance. I've entitled this little devotion, Fundamental Thanksgiving. Because there is a fundamental experience that we have all had in common in Christ. And that is the cross of Jesus Christ. Every born-again believer has been cleansed by the blood. Every born-again believer has been filled with the Spirit. Every born-again believer has been delivered from judgment of sin. Every born-again believer has their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if that was it, and it's not, but if that was it, we should get up every single day saying, thank you, God, that I am not going to a devil's hell, but I am going to spend all eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. Are you with me today? Hallelujah.